Welcome everyone to our Nobel Physics webinar. We're all very excited to have you here today. So my name is Harry and I will be one of your hosts for today. Hi everyone, my name is Pearl and I'll be your other host for today. Thank you so much for being here. So not only do we have uh, audience members from all over Canada, but we also have those joining us from all around the world. For example, Spain, Australia, Brazil, India, China, and many other countries. So I'm very glad to have such a diverse group of interested students and parents and to see that so many people are interested in STEM and research. Uh, I also wanted to give a special thank you to our lovely guest speakers today, Mr. Arthur McDonald and Tarnam Afifi for making this event possible and for sharing with us their incredible experiences. Uh, so, uh, can everyone hear me? Okay, so my co-host Pearl is from the Voice Gavel Club who we've collaborated with to bring forward this event. And here's just a little bit about each of our organizations. So as many of you might have heard already, uh, the Canadian Physics Society is a youth-led nonprofit initiative aimed at uh, improving access to physics and promoting the study of physics and providing youth with the necessary resources to explore their passion. Uh, we have a lot of videos and resources on our website uh, centered around learning physics, physics contests, and physics research. Uh, as well, like truthfully speaking, physics opportunities in Canada, especially for high school students, they're quite unknown. And this is what we're trying to combat with our events. And hopefully our seminar today uh, will be able to shed more light upon the vast world of physics research and how you can get involved as well. All right, hello everyone. I'm the president of the Voice Gavel Club and now I'll just introduce a bit about this organization. So the Voice Gavel Club is a public speaking humanitarian leadership group for students in high school in Canada. And it was founded by Toastmasters International. So we have meetings every other Monday where we partake in different fun activities like impromptu speeches, prepared speeches and debates. And we use these public speaking skills that we learn in, the, in this organization in real life to work on our humanitarian leadership. And we speak to the public about the importance of serving others who are less fortunate. And one of the charities that we work with is World Life Institute. And that was founded by Dr. Asaf Durakovic, who was a medical doctor with a specialty in nuclear medicine. And this charity has a global nuclear awareness program. So our club also has some connections to physics. So you might be wondering, right? One of us is a physics organization. The other is a public speaking organization. Why are we hosting this event together? Well, um, together, the Canadian Physics Society and Voice Gavel Club, we hope to inspire youth to pursue the study of STEM and eventually become leaders in their respective fields. So, like, you might think STEM and public speaking aren't connected at all, right? They're separate fields. But in reality, it's very important to have both. There's no lack of uh, STEM students in the world, and there's no lack of people who are good at public speaking in the world. But if you have both, that's how you can change the world in a positive way. And uh, take, for example, all the big tech CEOs, right? Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, um, Steve Jobs, they all have very strong STEM backgrounds, but they're also very good at public speaking. And even our accomplished guest speakers today who have made world-changing discoveries have, have to be able to present their findings and research at international conferences. So public speaking and leadership in STEM are not so separate after all. And by having this event, we also hope to break the stigma of these awkward STEM students without any good 
communication skills, and we hope to inspire people to have a balance of both STEM and public speaking. And we also have here a young, intelligent woman like Tarnam sitting here with us today, and we want to empower women in STEM and inspire women in STEM as well. All right, so if we could have our lovely speakers introduce themselves, that would be great. Tarnam, why don't you start? Okay. Uh, so my name is uh, Tarmeen Hakiki. Uh, I, I just graduated from the Bachelor of Science uh, with a specialization in uh, biophysics. Uh, and during my undergraduate studies, I did uh, lots of research and worked on projects that spanned multiple physics subfields, biophysics, astrophysics, and medical biophysics. Um, and uh, I have such a diverse experience uh, in research because I'm a big advocate for uh, integrations of science and the integration of different um, uh, STEM areas. Um, so uh, maybe something related to uh, this webinar uh, is that I was one of the Lindo Nobel laureates uh, meeting uh, as participants. Uh, that took place in 2019. For those who don't know that Linda Nobel Laureate meeting, um, it's a meeting that happens annually for both um, like Nobel laureates in a specific um, specialty, like a Nobel uh, Prize specialty, and all of that top young scientists from around the world. So in 2019, um, there was about uh, 60 something Nobel laureates who were there from what I remember and around 500 young scientists from around the world. Um, so yeah, so uh, the, the research institution um, for Prof. McDonald at Queens uh, was the organization that nominated me and Prof. McDonald was the Nobel laureate who kind of took me um, under his name as one of the young scientists in Canada. Um, yeah, and I can talk more about um, how I got nominated and more about uh, my experience in there later on uh, in the webinar. Okay, so I guess it's my turn. So uh, I graduated from high school in 1960. That's 1960. <laughs> it's still a long time ago. Um, I uh, went to Dalhousie University and talking about public speaking, my, uh, my close friend and I that I studied physics with in the first year uh, decided we would enter the university-wide debating contest uh, in the first year. And we won, beating two graduating lawyers as it turns out. And uh, so I ended up uh, doing physics. I'll tell you a bit about what I do. He ended up as a senior advisor to the finance minister of Canada and then the prime minister of Canada and had and still is an advisor uh, in uh, major ways to, uh, to the government. So there's no doubt that public speaking uh, goes together. He's also trained in, uh, in STEM subjects, but also studied a doctorate in operations research, which is very valuable as well. Um, so I went to Dalhousie for our undergraduate and for a one-year master's degree, went to Caltech for four years uh, for a PhD in nuclear physics, and uh, but studying often particle physics topics within the nucleus. I went to Chalk River Labs in Deep River, on Chalk River, Ontario, um, through the 1970s. Was uh, invited to come to Princeton, at the beginning of the 80s, as a tenured professor. Uh, working on basic science studies, but using nuclear physics and particle physics techniques. Uh, I was a part of the group that started the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, which is what we eventually won the Nobel Prize for. And uh, uh, in 1989, I returned to Canada uh, to become a professor at Queen's and to lead the project. Uh, we uh, had the project running first, starting in 1998. Uh, it's a complex project, which I'll describe to you. Had results uh, through 2007. 
and uh, have now converted it to uh, yet another uh, physics topic that I'll describe. And I've been working on studying not neutrinos from the sun, which was our original objective, but instead uh, dark matter. And uh, we're trying to understand what is that dark matter that's in the space between the stars when you look out on a, on a starry night. It's, it's about five times as much matter holding our galaxy into its current form that is made of something completely different than you or me or any of the glowing stars. And it's a big mystery. And we have the one of the best places to look for it in our laboratory snow lab near Sudbury. So, uh, so here I am more than 60 years later, uh, still having a great time doing science. And so I can highly recommend science and technology as a career. So uh, let's, let's talk about such things as we go forward. And then Atarnam and I will be happy to answer questions after we've had a chance to say a few words to you. All right, so as our guest speakers have mentioned before, they both went to the Lindo Nobel Laureate meeting in 2019. So does either of you wanna talk a little bit more about it? Well, maybe I can say a word or two. Um, these are special conferences which are uh, attended by uh, Nobel Prize winners and a large number of undergraduate uh, and graduate scientists around the world. Um, this is the group from Canada that attended. You can see Tarnum front and center. Um, we managed uh, to twist a few arms and get more than the normal number of Canadian delegates this year. And I was on the selection committee that uh, picked Tarnum. Uh, um, one of the letters that she received from her professors at the time said, uh, the Lindau conference will be poorer if Tarnum does not attend. So uh, I think she had strong support from her, uh, from her professor. She has been an activist for physics, for STEM subjects in general, for women in physics, uh, for many things. These conferences, the Nobel laureates give lectures on their specialty and also participate in substantial discussion sessions with the students who are there on many different topics. Some of them, uh, at least one of them was a, an outdoor walk and talk at the same time in a very beautiful setting on Lake Constance in Southern Germany. So uh, wonderful setting and, and, and I found the lectures just as interesting, I think, as the students did, uh, hearing all of my uh, my heroes giving talks on on in physics uh, over that period of time. Perhaps you want to add something, Darnell. Uh, so the Nobel Yet uh, meeting uh, is is an experience that uh, something that that was much more beyond my imagination. Uh, I mean, something that would, you know, that stood out to me is that I am sitting there uh, in Germany in the front rows, surrounded by Nobel laureates, and we're all hearing the same lecture. You know, like just being physically in there um, was something, something that just lasted in me um, till now. Um, yeah, so um, I was doing uh, research on astrophysics at York and then one day my professor and my supervisor was saying that um, Prof McDonald's an institution um, has this opportunity to send young scientists to the Nobel Laureate meeting would you be interested and I was uh, uh, so happy to learn about the meeting I went online and I read about all the, you know the blogs in there the articles of other people's experience um, and yeah and I applied and uh, uh, thankfully, I got selected. Um, yeah, and, and I spent a week in there. That was, it was just so beautiful, um, all full of physics, and it was, it was quite inspiring. All right, now we have Mr. McDonald, and he will be talking about some of the research that they're currently doing at SNOW and some of his um, award-winning research with neutrinos. So 
Thank you. Okay, so uh, let me uh, share my screen. Uh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, You'll have to enable it for me. I will enable it for you. Okay, Pearl, do you wanna stop sharing your screen for a second? Thank you. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what I'm gonna talk about is a situation where we found ourselves able to do a very fundamental experiment by establishing conditions that are unparalleled anywhere else uh, in terms of having a very low radioactivity location. And this was in a mine in Sudbury. It started with the so-called Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, which is what won us the Nobel Prize. It's two kilometers underground, about uh, four CN towers deep. Um, and uh, it uh, is uh, now expanded with the addition of uh, about three times as much excavated volume and about, well, a number up to six or seven uh, new experiments, principally studying dark matter in this region near the original experiment that you see here on the left. Why do we do this? Why do we look for the lowest radioactivity location? Well, usually when you when you push any unique capability with technology, then you are able to do something in science that is otherwise unattainable. And very often it's a two-way street. Pushing the science requires you to develop other new technologies, which then enable not only from the technology assisting human kind, but also assisting basic science. But in this underground location, in this very low radioactivity situation where the rock above us shields out the cosmic rays that otherwise would make our detector glow like the northern lights, which are also caused by certain types of cosmic rays, um, instead of having it light up like the sky does, we were able to detect one neutrino an hour from the nuclear reactions that power the sun. And thereby we were able to study the sun at its very core, the reactions that are powering it. We were also able to study properties of neutrinos that, were, that are very difficult to detect because they can pass through virtually anything, including the very dense material in the sun and the two kilometers of rock above us, we had to build a detector the size of a 10 story, story building in order to see one an hour. That was very successful, both in terms of the properties of the sun and the properties of the neutrinos. We are now pushing on with what's called Snow Plus to study neutrinos that come from the earth, from the decay of uranium and thorium, providing a significant 40% or so of the heat flow out of the earth. Very interesting from a geotechnical point of view. We're studying dark matter particles, which we know are there holding our Milky Way galaxy in its current form, but whose properties we do not know at all. We're also able to observe dark matter influencing uh, shapes in uh, far distant, uh, astronomical measurements. And in fact, we can infer the influence of dark matter particles on neutrinos in the evolution of the universe itself. So we study some of the most basic scientific questions you can think of. How do stars like our sun burn? What are the basic laws of physics? What's the composition of our universe? Where does dark matter fit? One place we think it does not fit is in what has been known as the standard model of elementary particles, which has been developed over the last, uh, well, basically during my scientific life. Uh, quarks were first proposed around the time that I was in university. 
in the early 1960s. Uh, we actually had a, we thought it was a nice novel term and we, we had a, 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 a sailboat in Halifax Harbor that we called the Quark, which we thought we were being very, very modern in physics by, uh, uh, by doing that. But now it has become the standard. And this is the way it works. You know, perhaps from your, from your studies of physics so far, that the nucleus contains protons and nucleon, pro protons and neutrons. They're both called nucleons. Um, and they form the core of an atom. Electrons surround the nucleus, giving uh, an overall neutral object. But the chemistry of atoms is defined by the numbers of electrons. And so that basically defines the physics of, of ordinary matter. All of that comes from the first row that you see here of elementary particles that uh, involve up and down quarks, as they're called, electrons, and these things called neutrinos that are associated with electrons. Neutrinos are very unusual particles. They only feel the weakest of all the forces. And you see on the right here, forces representing the electromagnetic, the strong interaction that binds the quarks and the, and the nuclei together. And this weak interaction is many millions of times weaker. And so they're produced in the type of nuclear reactions that power the sun. You have a, a, about 5 million a second going through your thumbnail or any space on your body of that size, square centimeter roughly. And yet only once in your lifetime will one of them stop in your body and you won't even notice it. They can travel enormous distances through dense matter without any effect. And so they're hard to uh, detect, uh, but in detecting them, we were able to determine that their mass is not zero. The only particles we know that are, have mass zero and travel at the speed of light are the, pro, the photons corresponding to the electromagnetic interaction. We only have a limit on the mass of neutrinos, but we know that they have a mass that's generated by a very different theoretical mechanism than any of these other particles, which have, which have been observed, the other generations, as they're called here, that line up involving charmed and strange quarks and muons and top and bottom quarks and tau particles and associated neutrinos have been observed in cosmic rays and in high energy physics experiments. They all get their mass from a, a mechanism involving the Higgs boson. Neutrinos get their, get their mass from an unknown mechanism so far, but one that probably influences how the universe has evolved in its very early stages. For every one of these particles, we have what are called antimatter particles. Particles such that, for example, with the electron, the antimatter particle is a positron. When positrons, which are emitted in radioactive sources, find electrons, they annihilate with them, leaving uh, pure energy, which comes off in the form of gamma rays back to back. And that's how positron emission tomography works in a medical setting, where you put detectors around someone, inject them with a radioactive su substance containing positrons. And when the two gamma rays are emitted, you look for coincidences between particle detectors on either side of the person, and you can just connect the dots between the uh, different particle detectors that fire simultaneously and see where that radioactivity is concentrated. It turns out it's concentrated in a different part of your brain. For example, if you're listening to music, than if you're trying to think about the answer to a mathematics problem. So it's, it's both a dynamic process and also a way of finding tumors uh, in a very accurate way. So antimatter and matter annihilate to form energy. It turns out in the early universe, we think that energy 
was converted into equal amounts of matter and antimatter. And one of the big puzzles is, where's all the antimatter these days? We're all made of matter, except for those radioactive sources. And then we come to dark matter. As I say, in the spaces between the stars, there is something that seems to have about five times as much mass as anything that you would call ordinary matter, as represented by those glowing stars. But what is it? It doesn't fit anywhere in this model. It must be a different type of particle. Big puzzle for physics today, great fun. That's what physicists love, is the opportunity to, uh, to look for such puzzles and to push our understanding of things further. In this case, it's astrophysics and a form of astrophysics called particle astrophysics, which is basically what we're doing in that underground laboratory I mentioned. Neutrinos, I've been talking about substantially, they're basic particles. We don't know how to divide them or electrons or quarks any further. And we always limit ourselves to say, this is as much as we know so far. Maybe they are made up of other smaller particles. We don't know. We don't have the resolution to tell. I showed you how they fit in the standard model. They can pass through the amount of lead that light travels in a year with only about a 50% chance of hitting something, because they have to hit the nucleus of an atom or one of the electrons head on in order to stop or have an interaction. It makes them very difficult to detect, but it's very valuable for getting them out of the sun if that's what you want to study. The standard model in its initial form said that they should have a zero mass, but by observing them to have changed from one type to another, which is what we measured in our experiment and what the Japanese experiment also measured, we're able to say that they do have a finite mass. It turns out that in order to do this change process, then they can't be traveling at the speed of light and therefore they must be traveling slower than the speed of light according to Einstein's special relativity. And that means they have to have a finite mass. This is the detector that we built in that location, two kilometers underground in a very active nickel mine near Sudbury. In the middle is a thousand tons of what's called heavy water, <clears throat> D2O instead of H2O, an extra neutron in every hydrogen nucleus, <clears throat> which typically makes it heavier, but doesn't change the chemical properties <clears throat> significantly. That heavy water gave us a real advantage in detecting neutrinos. And we observed it in several different ways. One reaction where there was an interaction with that extra neutron directly produced a fast moving electron that was observed by about 10,000 light sensors looking in at the central volume of heavy water through an enormous 12 meter diameter, five centimeter thick acrylic sphere. It had to be constructed out of 120 pieces in order to get it down in the elevator in the mine that we call the cage and through the drifts of the mine, which are the corridors getting to the, to the detector. It's all surrounded by ultra pure water and it's contained within a waterproof and radon-proof outer liner in order to keep the radioactivity locally to a very low level. This shows you some of the construction where we're putting it together out of these 120 pieces I mentioned. You can see the light sensors looking in at the central volume as it's nearing completion. You can see all of the cables that are connecting each one of these 10,000 light sensors to our computer. Everybody coming in after the walls were sealed, took a shower and wore lint-free clothing to keep the radioactivity levels at a very low level. We had less than a gram of mine dust on the entire detector. So this shows you what happens. Two 
nuclei come together and they fuse in the sun. Uh, and this happens to be one of the billions of neutrinos produced that happens to be heading towards Sudbury and towards our detector in this simulation past our surface building, down past the various levels of the mine, heading for the detector and bang, once an hour, we see a burst of light that we can distinguish from all of the other radioactive, radioactivity induced events that also produce light in the detector. We're also able to observe one other reaction. And this is what makes the heavy water detector unique. That other reaction is one in which that neutrino would simply break the deuterium apart into a proton and a free moving, elect free moving neutron. And that neutron, we had various ways of detecting it, enabling us in that reaction to detect the sum of all three neutrino types, electron, muon, or tau. In the first reaction I mentioned, where there's an interaction directly with the neutron, only electron neutrinos can do that. So we observe the first reaction for electron neutrinos that have survived. We observe the second reaction for all other neutrino types. And lo and behold, we observed that only one third of the neutrinos that in fact were emitted survived. And this shows you a plot of the number of neutrinos per square centimeter per second as measured in our experiments, one event per hour for several years. Here in red is the number of electron neutrinos. Here on the right in blue is the number of all neutrino types. The measurement here at the top of the blue column agrees very well with the solar model predictions, the calculations of how the sun burns. And so in one measurement, we were able to confirm that the calculations of how the sun burns are very accurate. But at the same time, we observed that not all electron neutrinos, which are the only type that can be produced in the sun, survived as electron neutrinos. There's a process involving a finite mass for neutrinos that makes this possible. We are not able to measure the total neutrino mass with that process. We can only measure the difference in mass between the three types. We had to wait until we had statistical accuracy such that there was less than a 10 million chance for neutrinos not to be changing from one type to the other before it was considered a uh, a discovery in particle physics, and we attained that in 2002. That's what the Nobel Prize was awarded for. So what's the significance of it? Well, first of all, we contributed to physics at a very basic level. Secondly, we now know how the sun burns with great accuracy. These are very similar to the calculations that are used to, to develop fusion power here on Earth in things like the International Tokamak Project in which Canada is participating with international collaboration in France. We now know because we're able to set a limit on that mass for neutrinos that they are not the dark matter, which was what the thought was when we first started our experiment. And that, that is a strong motivation for the establishment of Snow Lab, I was the director of the Snow Project, the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory Project. My colleague, David Sinclair from Carleton University established Snow Lab as we were completing the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory Project. Let me now switch the topic to the second major piece of physics that we're aiming at, and that is dark matter detection. This is what we now think has happened with respect to the evolution of the universe. About 13 and a half billion years ago, there was a tremendous expansion that occurred, referred to as inflation, arising from a 
enormous release of energy and the conversion of that energy into matter and antimatter particles in equal amounts. In the first 10 to the minus 32 seconds when the universe was still 10 to the 27 degrees Celsius in temperature, these matter and antimatter pairs were generated. How did the antimatter decay away, leaving us in a matter dominated universe? One of, the, one of the theories for how that occurs involves properties of neutrinos that we're studying with the next generation of the snow experiment called snow plus, where we're looking for a very rare radioactive decay called neutrinoless double beta decay. As the universe cooled off, it, the quarks came together to form protons and neutrons after about a microsecond. After about three minutes, when it was still 10 to the eighth degrees Celsius, the nuclei began to form, the very lightest ones, hydrogen or helium. Following about 300,000 years, we had a situation where the electrons managed to attach themselves to the nuclei, making a neutral uh, C uh, and enabling light to shine through. This resulted in the ability to make measurements of something called the cosmic microwave background radiation, which has been studied exquisitely by the astronomers, mainly through the use of satellites. Being able to get above the atmosphere has turned out to be another one of these amazing technological advances somewhat similar to the advance we made by going underground for other measurements that give you an opportunity that otherwise you could not have had. And so a lot was learned about how the universe has evolved by studying that uh, cosmic microwave background radiation. It, infer, it infers and, and other measurements also infer the existence of dark matter and dark matter and the rest of the matter formed stars and galaxies. And now it says 15 here, but it's now thought to be 13 and a half billion years. We have the universe that we now inhabit. Now, some other evidence for the fact that dark matter exists in a galaxy that looks like ours. We can't see, you know, our Milky Way galaxy looks like a pancake. And the reason you see it as, a, as a, a band on the sky is that you're looking edge on at the pancake. But if you can look at other galaxies where you can measure the velocity of the stars as they move out towards the outer regions, you get a profile that looks like this. Whereas if it were being held in by the gravity of only the glowing stars, it would have to follow a pattern like this lower curve here, inferring that there is other matter with a, with a mass profile that you see here in what's called the halo uh, of dark matter in the galaxy. Similar things are observed with five times as much as glowing matter if you study what's called gravitational lensing predicted by Einstein in his general relativity, where you get these distortions of images um, in uh, uh, detailed astronomical observations. So we now think that the universe is made up of only about 4% us, 26% dark matter, and another 70% of something which is referred to as dark energy, which is inferred from the fact that when they measure the most distant stars and how fast they're moving, it appears as though there's a very small repulsive force of gravity. In addition to the attractive force you'll learn in your basic studies of gravity in high school. And that can be translated into an amount of energy corresponding to about 70% of the total, uh, total energy in the universe. One of the forms of dark matter could be 
very massive particles that are weakly interacting. They're here in our galaxy by going underground and giving very sensitive targets for these uh, dark matter particles to interact with, we can seek uh, measurements of them directly. Here you see more detail of Snow Lab, that new area with the new cavities, and, and a whole set of experiments, most of them aimed at dark matter, that are presenting opportunities for observation of these particles. The deep experiment that I've been involved in looks for these particles with liquid argon. You see that on the top on the left. The uh, PICO experiment looks for bubbles that are formed when there's a disruption in the liquid, uh, typically involving fluorine uh, in uh, producing a bubble. And others have other tricks whereby they can eliminate radioactivity and uh, observe what the effects of dark matter could be. This shows you how clean the lab is. It also shows you Stephen Hawking when he visited for the second time in 2012, one of the most amazing people as well as scientists that I have ever met. And uh, he was very interested in our work to the degree of coming back after his initial visit in 1998 he had survived pneumonia earlier in the year 2012, still wanted to get underground in order to observe the progress in building Snow Lab. This is what the deep experiment looks like inside. It's uh, currently being updated for even more sensitivity. We in the deep experiment have joined with scientists from 14 other countries uh, in a sequence of experiments where the next one will be a hundred tons of liquid argon in Italy in an underground laboratory. The deep experiment had three tons of liquid argon, which has a very valuable asset. And that is if it's a nucleus that's recoiling by being hit with a weakly interactive massive particle or a wimp, it produces its light in about 10 nanoseconds. Whereas if you have a radioactive background produced by gammas or betas, then you find that it leaks out over about 500 times longer. So we digitize every one of our pulses. Big difference from when I was doing experiments back in the 1960s, when we had no capability like that. But today we can do it. And that's a way in which we take advantage of the latest technology. Very different scale experiment, as you can see here, taking advantage of technology development at CERN, the high energy accelerator in Europe, where actually what they're trying to do is to have enough energy to make dark matter particles for the first time since the Big Bang by colliding protons at a very high energy. The uh, detector is about to start construction. We took a little detour from our basic science starting in March 2020. Oh, I should have changed this. Uh, this slide, that should be March 19th, 2020, just as COVID was starting. All of these dates are in, in 2020, except the final one. Um, members of our scientific collaboration who generally do basic science teamed up with people from Canadian national laboratories like Chalk River uh, National Lab, uh, Triumph Accelerator Lab, Snow Lab, and the McDonald Institute. And uh, we developed a new form of ventilator, which is tailored specifically for intubated ICU patients suffering from COVID. We managed to have basically a, a unit uh, available in about, well, we developed the first units in about two months. And then it took another six months for certification, but ultimately we supplied about 7,300 of them for the Canadian stockpile in Ottawa. This shows you the sort of thing that this device does. That's a profile of uh, pressure and airflow in the lung simulated on the right. You can see how the operator, the respiratory therapist can easily 
change the parameters. Uh, it, it basically works uh, as you might have hoped. So science is fun. I've had an enormous number of years of, of great fun. Keep being curious. You can study anything in the universe. Take your pick. It's a great occupation. And pushing technological boundaries is what makes you able to make these valuable contributions to society. It turns out actually that only about 25% of the scientists from the SNOW project, we surveyed the graduate students and postdocs, 25% of them were university professors. The other 75% were in very valuable positions in industry, in government, even in, in uh, uh, financial institutions like JP Morgan. Training in basic science is valuable no matter what you end up doing in life. Learning evidence-based decision-making is what you learn in STEM. And uh, it's a very, very valuable area to go into as a university uh, education. Thank you. Oh, by the way, if you want to have a little bit of fun. It's an illustrious list, including Lester B. Pearson, Alice Monroe, and now a guy from Cape Breton. This is Arthur McDonald, Canada's latest winner of a Nobel Prize. Here to explain why he's the best in the world at what he does is Art McDonald. Hi, I'm Art McDonald. I'm a professor emeritus at Queen's University, originally from Cape Breton, and I attended Dalhousie University. And I'm a co-winner of the 2015 Nobel Prize in Physics. Uh, people from uh, 22 Minutes have asked me to come in and explain what uh, I and our team did to win this prize. We demonstrated that the flavor of neutrinos produced in the core of the sun, electron neutrinos, changed into one of the other two flavors, muon and tau neutrinos, as they traveled from the core of the sun to... Okay, I'm, I'm being told I have to make it simpler. Um, neutrinos are very basic subatomic particles that we don't know how to subdivide any further. And okay, they're asking me to uh, dumb it down a little bit. Um, a subatomic particle is uh, smaller than an atom. Atom is a unit of matter. Really? You don't know what matter is? It's seven. Okay. Uh, neutrinos are like Timbits. Chocolate. Uh, sometimes they're like uh, uh, cherry filled. And sometimes they're like the. Uh, the first person to ever won a Nobel Prize at Timbits. So well, that's their script. And I had some fun, fun using it, and uh, uh, I hope that that made it all clear at the end. That the rest of it was a little more difficult. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. McDonald. That was truly eye-opening and very, very interesting, and especially the video at the end. So next <laughs> we. Next, we have Tarnam, who will talk about research from a young physicist's perspective. So off to you, Tarnam. Is it possible to show the parking slide? Um, so uh, my journey with physics has started in high school. Um, well, in middle school, um, middle school science was all combined into one subject um, that, you know, had all of biology, chemistry, and physics together, and we called it our science course. Uh, but I noticed that as we approach it, usually as we approach it, the physics portion of things, I got very, you know, um, I got very excited. I went out and kind yeah. of like. So, sorry to interrupt, but I think yeah. there's like a buzzing sound. I'm not sure who it's coming from. Maybe you can. Can you hear me? Is it better now? I Is think you can mute everybody other than Tarnum, or mute everybody, and Tarnum can 
and mute herself. See if that feels well. Yeah. Um, I think all, all the audience members they can't unmute. So. So okay, I'll try to unmute myself and see how things will change. There, just stop. Okay, did it stop and then come back? I think it's coming back it's now. Coming. So it's in your location, apparently, Tony. Yeah, I think it's something with my laptop, my headphones. Um, uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, should I join from myself instead of my laptop? And things will be better. That will take a minute or two. Well, are your headphones like plugged in all the way? Sometimes they make that noise if they're not. Yeah. Better. Perfect. Better? Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, okay. Actually, wait, it's back again. I'm sorry. It's back again. Um, I think it's something in my microphone, uh, that built in microphone in my laptop. It's not something in the headphones. Um, is it really disturbing? Uh, it's a little bit. I think the sound wasn't there where you were using uh, headphones. So maybe. Okay, I'll try again. Sorry about that. No worries. Um, is it any? How about now? Is it any better? No change. It's it's almost as though there's interference between the two um, uh, ways of. Uh, recording your voice. Uh, you know, there's a little arrow beside the mute at the bottom of Zoom, which mm -hmm. enables you to select which of the microphones you're using. Oh, okay. Do you have a, uh, can you specifically select, for mm -hmm. example, just the one on your computer or just the one on your headphones or whatever? Yeah, so uh, why now, how about now? It's there Did now. I... Better? It is there now. Okay. Um, is it any better? Still there? I, think it, I think it's a bit better there, yes. Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, okay. No, it started again, unfortunately, a little uh, bit. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, one second. Uh, I think I can maybe join from the phone. Um, and then have mm. it as like the microphone source and then, but it's still like- It's the... better now. If you okay. speak slowly, if you speak slowly, I think uh, it yeah. probably will be okay because I think there's a bit of feedback building up as you mm -hmm. speak. So try it that way. Okay. Uh, okay, so, and then um, I'll keep speaking with this um, case. Uh, and I think it's uh, really interesting. Just let me know, try to figure something else. Um, okay, so uh, back uh, to my physics uh, journey. Um, I started in high school. I like that I like physics. Uh, I always uh, question the why of things. Um, and I like puzzles. Um, when I went to high school, uh, grade 11, so there was that kind of uh, stigma around physics is that it's a very difficult subject and you should be trying to avoid it uh, as much as you can. Uh, and you know, the stigma was kind of surrounding me, especially because I am female in physics and, you know, somehow, you know, surrounded by other females and we're kind of fed the idea that maybe physics is not for women and female. But then um, my father, um, uh, he's a mechanical engineer, uh, and since a young age, he noticed that I am so much into math, physics, and all the subjects that are based on kind of um, logic. Um, so he was the number one support. Um, he would always encourage me to, uh, you know, um, study more uh, to nurture that um, appetite that I had. Um, so. So, so I, I think without my father's support to study physics, I would have fallen in the trap that physics is not for uh, females. 
and women. Um, so when I studied physics in grade 11, I was for sure I'm going to take it in grade 12. I loved it a lot. I had lots of fun. I got a very high grade. I was uh, encouraged to continue studying physics. Um, and then after grade 12, and then I decided to take uh, integrated science because uh, well, in joining my grade 12, I was taking the three sciences, uh, physics, biology, and chemistry. And then I realized that I'm making lots of connections with my other, the majority of my peers when one see that connection. Um, and physics was kind of the core of the connections that I started drawing between uh, the different subjects of STEM. Uh, I went into integrated science at York University. And then after that, I decided to specialize um, mostly in biology and physics and maybe give up a little bit of the chemistry uh, side of things. Um, and then during my undergraduate studies, uh, I got that chance to work on different research projects that had physics uh, and its form with applications to uh, biology, medicine, and astronomy. Um, um, and then during uh, my research um, positions, I had the chance to participate in uh, multiple conferences. One of them was the Global Women's um, Meeting. Um, and I see girls in STEM here on the screen. Um, so, um, you know, part of my undergraduate experience being an advocate um, and kind of encouraging uh, women to study more physics and, and to kind of normalize the idea that there are female and uh, female students in physics that are very successful. Uh, and, you know, because sometimes you might not be aware, especially if you're young and you're in high school, you might not be aware of the, uh, the enormous number of female scientists out there that actually made a tangible contribution, um, an outstanding contribution to um, physics. Um, so this is an overview uh, about my experience. Uh, if, if, uh, if you would like me to maybe touch on how to get research uh, experiences as an undergraduate student or maybe talk about how you can participate in physics outside of the classroom um, as a high school student. Uh, what do you think, Tim? Yeah, it would be great if you could talk about both of those things because I think yeah. a lot of people in the audience are either high school students, maybe some are undergrad and some are even like middle school. So it could be very yeah. helpful. Definitely. Um, so, um, so like for resources outside of the classroom, um, I mean, if you just Google, type in Google, uh, physics resources for high school students, hundreds of links are going to pop up with either programs so that you can participate in, um, or some just, uh, you know, engaging, um, knowledge presentations of concepts in physics um but but yeah i would i would if i am in high school now right now because you know in the past there not many of these opportunities existed um i would always keep an eye open at um physics societies like for example the canadian association of physics so they have like a whole section uh it's an it's a um uh, the national organization for uh, people in the physics field. Uh, they have a section uh, on their website that, that is full of resources um, that you can find programs that you can participate at. Um, also, if you have a university that interests you and you think that you want to go study there, um, open their uh, faculty, like science faculty uh, website and try to explore um, what they have to offer for high school students because many of them have kind of specialized programs. Um, maybe you can, it's kind of similar to a candy day that you go there for uh, a few weeks, you get introduced to research and physics and at the university level. Um, so it's something, you know, uh, it's an eye opener for sure. Um, so yeah, and then I mean, uh, if you would like, uh, like YouTube would be, of course, um, a way, you know, to get visuals um, and to kind of like 
know some fun facts about astronomy and about physics and about biology. Um, there are so many people in there that do a great job of sim simplifying complex ideas that require lots of knowledge to really get grasp on. Um, yeah, but then uh, for university and being an undergraduate student, um, that number one thing that you should be focusing on is mastering the knowledge um, in your curriculum. Um, you really need to know your stuff very well because everything built on, all stuff built on each other. Um, and if you want to contribute to research, research is about pushing the, knowledge, the boundaries of human knowledge. Um, so working really hard uh, on yourself and making sure that you understand the material very well and you have a really high GPA that will open lots of doors for you that you can, you know, get to you can get to be a research assistant or working research projects from very early years. Uh, so sometimes in physics it's a little bit difficult to participate to be a research assistant after the first year just because you know you need uh, to be able to, um, you know, make something, accomplish something by the end of your uh, research term. Uh, but, you know, there are some kind of courses that you can take as a first year student that, um, uh, that would kind of like teach you uh, the scientific process and how research is done. Uh, something that is also quite valuable uh, for doing research, either theoretical or experimental, um, is knowing uh, lots of computational languages and mastering them, uh, because computers are very powerful um, and helpful uh, when it comes to, to, to modeling things in front of us, uh, to understanding physics and, um, and, and understanding things around us. So, um, know as much computing languages as you can because uh, these are gonna give you an advantage. Um, and of course, uh, know your math very well um, and, and always be eager to learn more. Uh, and don't feel shy, always, you know, if there is a course that you took and then the professor maybe you learned that course is book a little bit about the um, research work and then that research work sounded interesting to you, uh, don't feel shy to go to their office hours and ask about more, um, more information and, 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 you know, have a little conversation with them because maybe that topic would be something of great, it turns out to be something that is interesting to you and then ask them if um, they want to maybe um, see your marks or see some research that you have done in the curriculum um, and that if they have like positions that they would be happy to have you in their projects uh, to assist them in their research and this way you can get to know more about uh, the topic um, that they're working on. Um, another thing is that I realized and something I noticed that I was an undergraduate student is that um, Many undergraduate students are drawn away from attending uh, physics conferences for undergraduate students, and I don't know why, but I believe they think that it's kind of like, uh, unfortunately, they think that it's a way of wasting time, but they would rather, you know, kind of like focusing on, on school work and, and on doing well in their classes and not go to conferences. But I just want to say that, uh, don't miss out on conferences. You get a chance to meet, you know, physics students from all over Canada or all over the world, uh, people working on different topics um, that you can, you know, you, you go there, you see people like standing beside their posters, like me standing inside my poster there at Sick Kids, and then they would like tell you about that little bit of uh, uh, physics problem that they're working on and how their level I was integrated in into medical imaging of physics of principles integrated into taking um, images of organs. Um, and there was some analysis in there on like, the structure and the development of organs. Um, so it's a great way of uh, meeting people, conferences, a great way of meeting new people, learning new physics, and also learning about uh, available opportunities 
that you can further um, participate in. So uh, I didn't try to ignore conferences. Uh, I believe many universities um, who even cover uh, the whole cost for your travels uh, and your stay. So you shouldn't be worried about something like that. Um, and um, so girls in STEM, um, I just want to say that sometimes, to be honest, when I was a physics undergrad, a biophysics undergrad, and I was maybe one, yeah, there were like one or two female in the class, it felt a little bit isolated, like I felt like I'm excluded sometimes, and felt isolated, felt different. Um, but when I attended the, um, the Women in Physics Conference by the Canadian Association of Physics, um, and I knew it's a conference made uh, specifically for uh, people who want to study physics. And then I went there and I met lots of other female students who were very passionate and interested in studying physics. I felt so that I feel not excluded anymore. Um, I, didn't, I didn't feel like um, I'm different from the rest of, of, of the physics students, I just realized that they, the majority are just uh, not female. Um, and there are some factors that contributed to that, that things are changing and whatever um, uh, whatever was uh, uh, was an obstacle in the way of, of, of the way of equal participation in physics for people from different backgrounds. Uh, these obstacles, we're working on it today as a society um, so here in Canada to kind of work with them, uh, to raise awareness and, and just uh, have uh, uh, that, that, that opportunity there uh, for whoever wants to study physics and, and choose it for a career uh, for them. Um, so that's uh, most of my experience. Um, and the one thing, last thing I want to say is that uh, another thing that made me feel different is that um, many students, when they go to university or undergrad, um, they, for example, specialize in astrophysics. But for me, uh, it was another different thing. I worked on a biophysics research project at the same time as an astrophysics research project, and I did well in both of them, and I was interested in both of them. Um, and sometimes people would criticize me and be, maybe you should focus on one thing and not spread yourself too thin. Um, but I just want to say to people out there who like me, who love um, it's just the different branches of STEM and you want to explore them um, and, and find the connections between them, I just want to tell them to keep doing that. Uh, because you actually, the great inventions and the great discoveries comes when you take the route that not the majority of take. And, uh, and yeah, believe it or not, um, there was some research proposal that I wrote that kind of was linking the structures of the uh, neurons in the brain to the uh, structures of the dark matters found in the universe. Um, so you never know uh, what is out there, so don't uh, limit yourself. Yeah, and that's all. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you so much, Tara. Um, I just have one question for you. So what does research look like as an undergraduate student when you're working with a professor? Like, What are some of uh, the responsibilities and tasks that you can do? Yeah, um, so when I was uh, applying for research uh, positions, um, I was kind of looking forward to that opportunity where I'd be, you know, in like coming up with new physics <laughs> and like, coming up with new models of myself. But I just want to say that as an undergraduate student, um, maybe you didn't do that much until your final year, until you got most of the knowledge and most of uh, the basics in there. Um, so for your early years of uh, participating research, you're kind of more of, uh, of you're, a, you're a learner. You're observe, observing as much techniques and as much information as possible. 
Um, um, usually the research positions for undergraduate students would, would have responsibilities that include you, if you're working on a theoretical related project, you would be uh, contributing to the data analysis uh, of that project. Like working, a uh, professor would give you a code, maybe you'd be like fixing that code, improving on that code, making it more um, efficient. Uh, or maybe a professor would give you the data and then you try to analyze, you know, kind of like clean that data and contribute to the um, output of it, to the analysis that comes uh, later. And then if you're working on experimental physics, uh, don't, don't, don't you expect or don't have the idea that you're going to be there. Uh, you know, designing an experiment from scratch and trying to build it yourself. I mean, uh, maybe in your your during your PhD uh, studies, you're going to be doing that, um, or as a research scientist later on. Um, but but yeah, you're you're just going to be exposed to kind of the experience and knowledge of the professor who's your supervisor, um, and and sometimes it might feel like you're you contributing a little to what is going on, but just know that it's valuable. If it wasn't valuable, it wouldn't, that position, that opportunity wouldn't exist. And yeah. All right. Thanks. Maybe I can comment on, comment a little bit on uh, uh, both as a high school student and as an undergraduate. Uh, undergraduate students, um, there are many situations where a summer job can be available, or if you're in a co-op program, a uh, full term, uh, we certainly have co-op students working at Snow Lab and they're, they're working on things that are very similar to what a, a graduate student would work on. Uh, I, when I was a student, I worked at uh, National Laboratory at NRC uh, in Ottawa as an undergraduate. Uh, Chalk River has such things, Triumph has such things. But summer schools are valid for both undergraduates and graduate students. Almost every university has summer schools in a wide variety of different, different topics. Um, Shad Valley is one example of an excellent program in the summer, which often couples to universities. But I just, just for fun looked up online, I think the University of Toronto has 28 summer programs in various disciplines across the country, across the, their set of disciplines. Um, another way in which under, in which high school students can get actively involved is through a science fair project. Uh, I've observed science fair projects and, uh, and in some cases judged them. And it, it turns out that some of the most successful ones, some of the ones I actually attended the national finals in Ottawa one year. And some of the most successful ones are ones where the high school student made a connection with a university faculty member and got to actually take a little bit of that faculty member's research program, use some of their equipment and, and answer a small segment of that researcher's broader research topic. But I think making contact with a physics department or chemistry or whatever you are, biology, whatever you're interested in, and see whether there are faculty members that are willing to help with a science uh, fair project, that's almost the only way that you can get involved during the normal school year. But in the summer, summer schools are legion on a wide variety of topics, and they're very good experience both in terms of understanding what it's really like to do research and also making connections with university people that can advise you when you're trying to figure out where you should go in your university career. A couple of suggestions from me. Thank you so much, Mr. McDonald and Tarnum. That was very helpful advice and I'm pretty sure everyone in the audience can appreciate that. So I think next we're gonna move into the Q&A section uh, where everyone in the audience, you can ask questions. And we've also prepared a list of questions that have already been asked during the sign-up stage. So if you wanna ask any questions, just type them into the Q&A feature. But we're gonna begin with the questions that have already been asked. So 
Um, the first question is, um, I know like there's a lot of parents uh, that are listening in as well that um, who wish their kids could be more engaged in STEM. So how can parents engage and inspire their kids to like STEM? And like, what kind of support can they give? Well, I think uh, I think it's it's really a question of uh, uh, of participating with their student in uh, first of all the sort of uh, uh, things they're working on in school, but also I mean it's a tremendous advantage these days compared to when I was in high school. When I was in high school, you had Encyclopedia Britannica, if you like, or something equivalent as the source of information or any library. These days it's available to you on the web. You can ask almost any question and get an answer. And there are also excellent uh, uh, summary, uh, summary uh, sites for various, uh, uh, various topics in, uh, in science and math um, that you can access to work with the student in attempting to understand the sorts of things that the student might find exciting. And to also get a feel for what one works on if you're in bioscience or if you're in fundamental physics or if you're a mathematician. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I think it's really just a question of uh, developing a rapport uh, with the student, um, demonstrating that you are of some value and helping them to try to get directions in what they're doing. And uh, in that way, uh, uh, try to uh, encourage them to consider this more, uh, more completely. One of the ways in which many people end up getting into science and engineering is by joining a robotics club in, in, at various places, either at the high school or locally. And that often involves a fair amount of, uh, of uh, parental involvement equivalent to getting up at 6 a.m. to drive you to a hockey practice. Uh, so uh, uh, that sort of thing is the sort of thing where parents can develop a, a rapport and be, by being helpful with their students. Uh, I would definitely agree with Prof McDonald. Uh, I think one of the top reasons that made me uh, love science and love studying it and, and pursuing it is it were the conversations that I had with my father uh, about science and about how the world and things work from a science perspective. Uh, so, you know, even these little conversations that you would have when you're going out on a walk about science is something that I think it would, would can resonate um, uh, in, in the student or Okay, so we have another question. Um, oops, so sorry. Uh, so the question is, what piece of advice would you give to your past self in high school or university if you can go back in time? Want to go first this time, Tarna? Yeah. Um, so um, I want to tell myself to not worry so much about uh, making decisions. I'm a person who likes to plan and, and plan the even teeny tiny bits of detail in me. Um, I, I would say to myself, just to be cautious, uh, follow your passion. Um, because you, you didn't know the, your potential, basically. You didn't know the opportunities that exist out there. So just don't be drawn away because you didn't know. Uh, try it if it's something that you like and you're passionate about. It's just go follow your passion, pursue what, what interests you. Um, and don't worry too much about the end results and the, the future and how things will turn out to be. Yeah, I would, I would echo that and say, have a balanced life. Don't just focus on STEM, even if that's your main interest. Uh, I mean, I, 
I met my wife uh, at social events in high school and we've been, we've been married for 56 years now. I have four kids and nine, nine grandchildren, uh, eight of them girls, by the way, and a number, number of them doing very well. Um, make sure you have the balance in your life socially, along with the sort of things that you're doing academically, because it's gonna turn out that your EQ, your emotional quotient, if you like, is gonna be just as important to you in your career um, as your IQ that I noticed some people were discussing on the chat. EQ is a very difficult thing to accomplish. It's basically your comfort in interacting in society and attempting to understand what another person is thinking. Uh, it's the way in which you will be able to interact with and collaborate with other people in a very effective way. And it's not something that's taught very overtly in school, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's very important in your life. Um, make sure that you get a balance in your life between social activities and academic activities. Thank you for both of your insightful answers. So another question that an audience member has is, how do you create contact with or find research opportunities with professors and especially as a high school student and the follow-up question is like do professors get annoyed by cold emails so i'm i'm a professor i guess i better try to answer that <laughs> one um no i don't think people get annoyed by a cold email i think uh uh if it's a zero content cold email, uh, they will uh, have less respect for it than it would than one where someone contacts them and says, um, I'm interested in your research. I'll, I'll take the science fair example. I'm interested in your research. I would love to do a science fair project that actually had some real science in it. Is there any part of your research where I might ask for your help uh, in uh, developing a topic that I could do, I could work on myself more extensively uh, in order to try to have a, uh, a useful uh, science fair project. You can, you can deal with the professor directly. You could contact the chairman of a, of a department and say that's your interest. And if you show yourself to, to be, uh, you know, someone who would be actively involved and, and, and interested in the topic, you'll get a lot further than, than if, you're, if you're sending a message that says, uh, can you tell me what to do, please? <laughs> Which uh, is not as, not as good in terms of uh, developing a relationship that could be valuable in the longer term. Doesn't have to be science fair. Uh, as I said, there's, there's uh, summer uh, projects that people uh, uh, sometimes have as well that undergraduates can get involved in. But in, in point of fact, in terms of hiring people for the summer, we are overwhelmed with undergraduate uh, students uh, applying and have to pick, you know, one in, one in three or four typically for summer jobs. So uh, it's hard to compete there, which is why I'm recommending summer schools rather than necessarily summer research to make a contact that might give you a summer research project the next year. Yeah, um, I, I think one thing that I found uh, that you know, in, uh, in getting to talk to the professors or connect with them. Um, so at York University, we do sometimes it's just public lectures um, and high school nights um, where, where we invite everyone from the community to kind of come on campus and listen to that professor or researcher talking about their fields. So um, if you like that topic where you, you know the professor, you read a little bit about what they do, you can go to these events and maybe at the end of the event, you would be introducing yourself and uh, talking about why you like that topic and, and what interests you and what you're looking and hoping to contribute uh, to, to kind of this research topic if you, if you would 
um, be a research assistant one day. Um, so you can get in touch with professors, not necessarily only through emails. Um, and I believe uh, even their offices, all professors at, at all universities, most of them, their offices can open to everyone, not only the undergraduate or graduate students. Um, so if there's a university that you like, you can go to the physics building in there and just walk around. Uh, you're gonna bump, to, uh, bump into undergraduate students and professors who are doing great things. And you can have great conversations. Everyone is uh, very welcoming and they all love to talk about uh, their work. Thank you so much. So another question that some students have is, like what level of physics and math knowledge do you need to have to begin doing research? So like, for example, do you need to have taken university level physics or does high school level math and physics, uh, does that work, is that enough? Well, it depends on what you're going to do uh, as a part of a team. Um, there's a lot of things, there are a lot of things that, uh, um, require you to become computer literate to some degree in order to then follow a process of analysis of data, which may not need you to understand quantum mechanics in order to do that activity. Um, you may want to, you would need to know perhaps quantum mechanics in order to propose the next experiment. But on the other hand, to get experience in how it is how, how a team works within uh, the accumulation of data, uh, where in this case, you could work hands-on in the laboratory in many cases, uh, using pieces of equipment where you really just need to learn that piece of equipment to analyzing the data that comes from it, where uh, you know some discussion with the professor would be adequate. So typically it would require uh, a fair knowledge of, uh, of mathematics in, in high school, um, but uh, not necessarily a full knowledge of, of the various sciences that you're dealing with, like physics or uh, astronomy or uh, chemistry or biology in order to be a valuable member of a team in a uh, research circumstance. Yeah, I would... Um... I totally agree with Rod McDonald. I think what made me stood out after 13 years when I was applying for a research position was the fact that I learned uh, computational languages that are outside of the curriculum that is being taught at my university. Um, and that, that, that computing language that I had was uh, quite relatable uh, to the research that the professor was doing. So computing skills is something that is very valuable um, and that will help you make sort of contributions to the research projects. Uh, try to learn the languages though that relate to physics because not all computing languages are, um, are that, you know, um, applicable. There are, not, there are some computing languages that are preferred more than others when it comes to uh, physics, astrophysics, and bio. Okay, thank you for your responses. Um, so we have another question here, which is, will the snow lab continue to expand? Um, <clears throat> right now, we don't have every location filled. Uh, but on the other hand, for the one major location that we um, have yet to fill, uh, there are several major international experiments that are interested in being located there because uh, Snow Lab has a very good record of uh, providing support for experiments and it's the only laboratory internationally that is ultra clean, uh, low levels of, uh, of dust everywhere, similar to the sort of thing you develop in, a, uh, in making computer chips, a clean laboratory everywhere in the lab. Um, and it's uh, equivalent in, in depth to the one other uh, laboratory uh, 
uh, at a similar depth, uh, which happens to be in China. So there's a lot of interest in Snow Lab. The question of whether or not more space will be needed underground will depend upon whether all of these experiments get funded and therefore need the space in order to push the sensitivity levels looking for this rare decay called neutrinoless double beta decay or looking for the sensitivity to observe dark matter. Typically, <clears throat> these are very weakly interacting or particles that interact only occasionally. Um, and uh, more mass of the detector is needed, which means more space in the underground laboratory. So I, I think uh, it's quite possible there will be additional locations required. It should be noted that the existing snow lab was excavated and constructed without interfering whatsoever in the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, observatory that was running uh, full blast right next door. So we've developed the techniques for doing that. All right, thank you. Um, and another question is what current and future research is being done in astrophysics? Would you like me to speak to that or turn to me? Well, okay, I thought perhaps you're sufficiently into it. One of the things that's being done actually is the sort of thing that Tarnum is working on, and that is the application of artificial intelligence to data analysis in the field. It's turning out to be very valuable uh, as a, a way of uh, attempting to uh, get more accuracy in understanding very complex, very complex data. Uh, and so uh, that's independent of the particular measurements that are being made, but. The measurements that are being made uh, range over a very large uh, set of topics. They're the ones I mentioned, looking for dark matter through its direct interaction with larger and larger scale detectors, looking for dark matter that uh, uh, may be observable in other particles observed from large scale astronomical uh, uh, objects such as the concentration of dark matter by uh, geographical, from a, a, a large mass of object like the sun, for example, where you study what happens if you collect a lot of dark matter and it starts interacting and producing other particles that could be observed. Um, there's a very successful experiment that has instrumented a space in the, under the ice at the South Pole. They go under the ice for similar reasons to the reasons we go underground, but they also use the ice as a detection medium. And they have one kilometer by one kilometer by several kilometers deep, but then another one kilometer that's instrumented as a, as a, uh, as a detector and, and uh, it's called ice cube. And it, uh, looks for some of the highest energy uh, neutrinos produced in the world. Uh, and they have made remarkable measurements at extremely high energies, like 10 to the 15 times uh, uh, or so greater than, uh, than the mass of an electron, for example. Uh, and, and these enormous energies are produced very often by material is being sucked into a black hole, producing neutrinos in the process and the neutrinos escape and uh, get, to, uh, get to Earth. So you're studying the highest energy reaches of the world. The measurements of gravitational waves, which are due to astronomical objects and therefore are, it's, it's physics of large astronomical objects where, where basically what you find is a, uh, a distortion of space, uh, essentially where the detector is caused by a wave produced by a very extreme distortion of space that happens when a black hole collides with another black hole or where two neutron stars 
collide with each other. Uh, and uh, so you look for a, a dynamic effect in time uh, to uh, observe these. The so-called LIGO, L-I-G-O experiment has done extremely beautiful work in this. Um, there's also development of uh, greater sensitivity in the topic I mentioned of, of studying the light that was emitted 300,000 years after the original Big Bang, the so-called cosmic microwave background. And, and the measurements that are being made of that almost exclusively, well, not, not exclusively, there's still measurements being done with well-designed and tuned telescopes at places like the South Pole, but the measurements made from satellites above the atmosphere uh, give really beautiful measurements of that particular topic and others that relate to trying to understand how uh, the development of the universe, its effects on the development of structure and so on, um, influence what you can observe from that light at that point in the universe and uh, the universe's evolution. So many fascinating topics. Uh, the the so-called event horizon telescope uh, that just took images of black holes, uh, or rather of the light produced in the vicinity of, of black holes, which is one of Stephen Hawking's major accomplishments of indicating that there would be uh, observable light that would escape from a black hole. The so-called event horizon telescope gets referred to as one telescope. It's actually five telescopes, I believe, uh, around the world that are linked together by the extremely beautiful communication systems we have these days around the world. So they can all work as one telescope and it, it effectively broadens the, the size of the mirror, which is usually the, 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 the measure of how sensitive a telescope could be to be the size of the earth. And so therefore they're able to make these exquisite uh, measurements. And most of the things I've been talking about have been developed in the last 20 years. In this case, that was developed in the last 10. And uh, so technology is continuing to enable us to make more and more extensive understanding of our, the universe around us and how it evolved. Uh, by more and more detailed studies. So it's a fascinating area these days. Thank you so much, Mr. McDonald. So I think we have time for one or two more questions. So another one is like, what does the research process look like? For example, posing a question to making a hypothesis to collecting data, like what does it actually look like? And how long does like a research project usually take? Well, it depends very much on the, the complexity of the research topic. The advantage, of course, is that um, usually a major complex research topic requires you to make a series of smaller measurements along the way to make sure that you can then develop the instruments that you're trying to design for the larger research topic. So you always have a typically a situation where you go into the laboratory in the morning, hoping to get a result that's gonna make you happy to go home in the evening and think of something else to do the next day to make further progress. However, if we talk about very major experiments like the ones I, I'm working on, these can take uh, five to 10 years to develop and typically 10 years or so to take the data. Uh, other experiments that are, that are being worked on in other STEM subjects uh, can take a much shorter period of time uh, and uh, uh, they are progress along a, a, a series of things that you're learning. I mean, for example, the reason why it was possible for vaccines to be brought out so quickly in uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of the recent pandemic is the fact that basic researchers have been 
studying the topic of vaccines for these types of viruses <clears throat> for many years and, and developing the capability that could be applied very specific, the knowledge that could be applied very specifically to the manufacture of the specific vaccines that, uh, uh, that ended up being so successful in limiting the, uh, uh, limiting the uh, effects of, uh, of COVID. Um, and uh, at the same time, there are other things that can happen very, very quickly um, in terms of artificial intelligence. Uh, there's a particular researcher at the University of Toronto who um, he and his research work group had worked for, for years on, uh, on uh, uh, algorithms, as they're called, for trying to do artificial intelligence processes like face recognition and so on quickly. And, and finally, about, uh, which probably by now, it's at least seven or eight years ago, they made a breakthrough. And that's why starting five years or so ago, all of a sudden your, your cell phone can recognize your face. It's because of a, uh, uh, a uh, discovery by a researcher who had uh, studied a number of topics um, could suddenly say, ah, let's try this. Oh, it seems to be working. Let's push it further. And over a period of a, of a couple of years, it, it became the successful approach to uh, algorithms for applying artificial intelligence to face identification and doing it quickly enough that you can do it in your cell phone. So it, 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 it varies substantially as to how quickly a breakthrough can be obtained. And, uh, and it is the day-to-day -day work that builds up to that breakthrough that is still an enormous amount of fun. Yeah, uh, I uh, maybe one thing that I would like to comment on is uh, how long the research project would take. Um, a research requires you to be uh, patient as much as possible. Um, so, you know, being young, you're sometimes too eager to see your results and see outcomes of the research project. Um, and maybe that one thing that would, you know, disappoint me a little bit because I would set myself some deadlines at the beginning of the research project, but you know, things don't, most of the time, they don't work as how you plan. Uh, and you take lots of detours and the time that you're planning ends up to you know, double, triple. Um, so that, that you learn a lot along the way um, and you have lots of fun. So, so research requires patience, I would say. By the way, the researcher at the University of Toronto who made a, an enormous breakthrough is Jeff, Jeffrey Hinton, professor at U of T. Thank you so much for your very insightful and extensive answers. Um, we have one final question um, for Tarnum and that is what research in, what does research in biophysics look like and how does it differ from pure physics or astrophysics? Um, so the biophysics research that I've done uh, was taking the principles of physics to kind of um, um, so apply it in two ways. The first way is to develop uh, techniques that can either get us better images that we can like either visualize biological molecules better or we can visualize uh, organs better. It's mostly about visualization because biology kind of requires you that you need to know as much as possible about what you're studying and that comes with your visualization. The other part is about um, the behavior of the biological systems of the molecular level. For example, um, you know, um, like the nerve system, um, we can apply I believe it or not, you can apply electromagnetism to kind of know more about the behavior of the neurons uh, and, you know, and contribute to the field of science. So it, it goes both ways. Um, first of them is uh, 
developing new techniques to understand the biological system. And then the second is um, applying physics to get a, get a better understanding of the biology itself, of the biological. Okay, thank you, Tarlam, for your answer. And I think that should be the last question of our Q&A. So I wanted to thank our wonderful guest speakers again for coming today and making this event possible. And I also wanted to thank Pearl and the Voice Gavel Club uh, for their collaboration with us to bring forward this event. And again, I wanted to thank all the audience members um, both on Zoom and on YouTube for watching our event and showing your interest in STEM and listening to our wonderful guest speakers. And um, look out for future events from both from Canadian Physics Society and from the Voice Gavel Club. So thank you everyone and have a good night. Thank you. Uh, and I want to thank Prof. McDonald for inviting me to do the webinar. Uh, it's always very exciting to hear the perspective of the Nobel laureates and about the fields of physics and about research. Yes, I, I enjoyed participating. I was very pleased to see such a large number of young people interested in, uh, uh, in STEM sci science topics, STEM topics. And uh, I wish you all well in your career. Uh, you can have fun in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to both of the organizers for arranging this. It was thank a you so pleasure much. having you both. Thank you for being here.